keep telling us, namely that the price of that the times of cheap energy are over and that the price of energy uh, uh, will be significantly higher in the future than we have uh, gotten used to in the past. So a significant increase in the price of energy will significantly increase the cost of production, which in turn reduces uh, supply of agricultural commodities, all other things being equal. And of course, with an increasing price of uh, energy, the um, bioenergy production will become more competitive. And finally, I have to add climate change to our discussion because uh, on balance, there are areas that will gain, areas that will lose because of climate change, but on balance, uh, agricultural production will decline, all other things being equal. And the all economic consequences of all this, of course, is that we will see an increasing price of food over time. We'll see an upward trend in agricultural commodity prices. And I want to illustrate this with the next two slides. This slide depicts the actual price of wheat between 1980 and the turn of the millennium, during the last 20 years of the agricultural treadmill. And what you can see here is that the straight uh, line, that's the trend of the, price, uh, of the wheat price of wheat during the last 20 years of the agricultural treadmill has a slightly negative slope. So prices were still going down. And please also notice that I've expressed the price in dollars here, so I wouldn't have to deal with the dollar to euro exchange rate. And uh, the next slide depicts the actual prices of, uh, prices of wheat from the turn of the millennium to 2006 and prices projected by USDA in 2006 for the time period 2007 to 2016. And as you can see, there is a clear cut positive trend in this price line. So prices according to this projection will go up moderately but significantly. It may be a nuisance for consumers in the rich countries, but for the poor of which we, in 2008 we had one billion who have a dollar 25 to spend every day or less and to have to spend 75% uh, or more of their meager income on food. This, even this moderate increase in agricultural commodity prices can have uh, dramatic impacts on their quality of life and health. So everything I've said so far is essentially good news for farmers around the world, or net food sellers, I better say, because an increasing price of agricultural commodities and food uh, acts to generate new income and, op uh, income and employment opportunities for farmers around the globe. It's also good news for uh, taxpayers because there's less need for agricultural price support, but there is bad news, of course, for the poor, uh, people who live in poor countries because world food security is going to uh, become a significant issue, not just a humanitarian issue, but a significant political issue because it can lead and will lead, much like it did in 2007, 2008, to food riots and other forms of violence because of high food prices and sustained periods of high prices, of course, might also trigger significant migration with all the attendant costs for uh, countries affected by emigration and immigration. In this context, it is also worth uh, remembering that the uh, United Nations in 1996, during the first World Food Summit, uh, formulated the ambitious goal of cutting in half the number of malnourished humans by 2015 relative to 1995. We have learned, however, that this objective is clearly out of reach to the contrary. The number of poor uh, people is uh, increasing. And the food deficit of the poor countries of the world once were net food importers when it came to trade with the rich countries. Now they are net food exporters. Now they are net food importers. And the food I import gap of the poor countries is likely to quintuple uh, between 2000 and 2030. And this rapidly growing food import gap of the poor countries can only be closed if the rich countries of the world produce more food and export more food and not less as it is sometimes claimed. 
Of course, it would be desirable if the poor countries of the world would contribute more towards their own food security. But even under the best of all realistic circumstances, will the poor countries of the world in the coming decades not even be close to feeding their rapidly uh, growing populations? And now I come back to climate change, because a significant increase in agricultural commodity prices, or the price of food, I'd better say, say, also increases the incentives for the poor who live in poor countries to go out in the woods, burn the woods in an attempt to claim additional agricultural land so they can feed themselves and their families. But already today, deforestation and the conversion of uh, pasture into cropland contributes more to global warming than uh, global industry. It contributes more to global warming than global transportation. And therefore, the result of everything I've said so far is that productivity growth in world agriculture is the key in the fight against hunger and malnutrition. It is the key in the fight against global warming. And it is crucial for the preservation of natural habitats and biodiversity. So with nearly all the variables that I've mentioned today, We've tried to build an economic model of world agriculture, and the purpose of this model was to project future prices of agricultural commodities. And the model we developed was finished about two years, uh, two years ago when we published this study. And this table summarizes the results of our analysis. We looked at the time period 2003-2005 as base period, and 2013, 2015, that was the time to which we projected agricultural commodity prices. And we looked at wheat, corn, maize, that is, other grains lumped together, and oil seeds lumped together. And our results suggest that prices of these key agricultural commodities uh, are likely to be 15 to 30 percent, are likely to go up 50, between 15 and 30 percent during the time period that we've analyzed. So that would be. Uh, consistent with estimates by the uh, United States Department of Agriculture and all, also the most recent projections by USDA and FAO. So we will see a significant but modest increase in agricultural commodity prices over time. However, when we had finished our study two years ago, we noticed two significant drawbacks. One was that we had not really accounted for the rapid growth in biofuel production around the globe. And the second was that we had calculated, made our price projections based on the assumption that the price of oil would remain constant at $40 per barrel. However, our energy economists that we have in Berlin keep telling us that the price of energy will be significantly higher in the future. So we went back to the drawing board and changed three things. One was we projected the price of agricultural commodities two additional years into the future because additional information was available. Second, we explicitly included sugar in our analysis, which we felt was appropriate if we wanted to capture the dynamic uh, of the biofuel production. And third, we assumed that the price of energy would go up from around $40 per barrel, that's what it was in the base period, to $100 per barrel in 2015, 2017. And as you can see, this dramatically changed our result. Now, in this scenario, prices of agricultural commodities would go up by between 50 and 100%. So if our projections are only halfway correct, then we would see a dramatic increase in the number of hungry and malnourished people around the world. Rather than one billion humans who don't have enough to eat, we may have by the end of this decade uh, two billion humans uh, in the same uh, situation. Of course, we were interested in what was driving the, the difference between our two models, and we quickly found out what was driving this, these results, or the, what accounted for a lot of the differences between the two models was that we had assumed that the price of energy would go up. Nobody really knows what the price of energy is likely to be towards the end of this decade. Not even our energy economists come up with reasonable uh, estimates, but if the price of energy continues to go up, 
then we will have significant increases in agricultural commodity prices around the world. In other words, the price of energy has become a key determinant of the price of food and agri other agricultural commodities uh, and will continue to do so in the future. So with this, let me conclude. What I've tried to say here is that, and one of the first things our students learn uh, when they uh, uh, attend my class in principles of economics is that productivity growth is the key for agricultural growth. And the point that I try to make here also is that productivity growth is the key in the fight against hunger and malnutrition. It's the key in the fight against global warming. And it is very crucial for the preservation of natural habitats and biodiversity. However, productivity growth is man-made. It doesn't fall from heaven like manna innovation is generated through uh, investment in research and development and time and again when we look at uh, these investments we find that from a societal point of view investment in agricultural research are highly profitable. <coughs> now let me tell you the story of the European Union neglecting uh, agricultural innovation and productivity growth. This is, on the left-hand side, all the exporting countries in the world in 2008. And as you can see, the European Union is the second most important exporter of agricultural commodities <laughs> in the world. However, it is by far the most important importer of agricultural commodities. And that simply means that the European Union has become and that hasn't sunk in with our policymakers and the general public, has become the single most important Im net importer of agricultural commodities in the world. Uh, China, as you can see, is a, closed, a close second. So we have then calculated the land that is necessary outside of Europe to produce the food that the European Union is importing. And the result is that the European Union now is importing about 35 million hectares of agricultural land, not actually importing the land, but virtually importing this land or grabbing this land. It's using the territory of the size of Germany to meet its <laughs> own needs for food, fiber, uh, biofuel, and so on, because it has neglected uh, productivity growth. And the next slide makes it even clearer. There you can see that in the last 10 years alone, uh, the net imports of virtual agricultural land, as we uh, term it, has increased by 40%, and that is about 10 million hectares. 10 million hectares is roughly equivalent to the territory of countries such as Poland, uh, Portugal or uh, Hungary. Thank you for your attention.